The Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business has a long history of working to promote the full participation of Aboriginal people in Canada's economy. This organization was established to respond to the changing social, educational, and economic needs and interests of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. In the last 25 years, Canada has witnessed significant events that have had a profound effect on Aboriginal people and communities. In 1982, with much fanfare, Canada repatriated its constitution from the United Kingdom. The new Constitution Act included Section 35, which defined Aboriginal people as Indian, Inuit, and Métis. It recognized and affirmed existing Aboriginal and treaty rights in Canada, which would prove to be a driving force of policy change and economic influence. However, constitutional change does not result in economic transformation overnight. Another breakthrough was needed, one that would provide a critical link between policymakers and the corporate world. In 1982, Murray Koffler, a leading Canadian business figure who founded Shoppers Drug Mart and the Four Seasons Hotel chain, put a stake in the ground. My wife, my Belle and I were in Calgary because the Four Seasons was under construction for its hotel there. I was one of the founders of Four Seasons Hotels. And I was just in the basement, and it was damp, and it was cold. There were two Indian families in that basement. And, and it was just something that I really couldn't believe, but anyway, I, I let it go. On the same day, I go to Shoppers Drug Mart. A young boy was being escorted out of the store by our security people. It was a horrible sight, and, and that stayed with me. Those two occasions being together stayed with me. I went to Ottawa for, a, for an embassy gathering, and Barney Danson, the Minister of Housing, was there. And I told Barney exactly what I saw, these people living in those conditions, and this boy being whipped out of the store. And I said, what does, what's, what's happening? How can you allow this to happen? Then he says, why doesn't business do something? And that sort of stayed with me. And that's, I guess, when I felt that, well, he's right. We have to do something. So I gathered a group of people around us, both from the uh, indigenous community, from the government, uh, from business, from public relations, and we got together on our first planning meeting at Jokers Hill. Those initial meetings at Jokers Hill culminated in the creation of an organization in 1984, the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business, then known as the Canadian Council for Native Business. Koffler and his founders resolved to stimulate and nurture business opportunities between the mainstream business community and the Aboriginal community. Understanding that government-led initiatives could never solely develop strong Aboriginal business and economic development, Koffler and his team got to work on an ambitious series of programs. These would prove fundamental to increasing the economic independence of Aboriginal people. We just had to have an understanding of each other. And if we get to understand each other, then we could, uh, business people will start to be involved. It came about by youth programs at the very, very beginning, and then later internships and later business co co uh, cooperation. So it started small, with in, in very small programs, but all of these have developed over the years. 1990 was an important year that put the Constitution to the test. In June, Elijah Harper, a Cree man from Red Sucker Lake First Nation in Manitoba, took a stand in the Manitoba legislature. He refused to accept the Meech Lake Accord, which was negotiated without the input of Canada's Aboriginal people. Later that summer, the nation was gripped by a land dispute, the Oka Crisis. Ganasidake Mohawks in Quebec led a tense standoff asserting their rights to sacred burial grounds that a land developer intended to turn into a golf course. These two incidents revealed the urgent need for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people to work together to resolve disputes. By 1991, the CCAB was working hard to ensure the business and Aboriginal communities were collaborating for mutual benefit. 
CCAB partnered with Corporate Canada to place more than 500 talented Aboriginal business professionals, artists, and entrepreneurs in jobs through its Business Management Internship Program. This success provided the on-the-job management training Aboriginal candidates needed to succeed in the mainstream corporate world and eventually start their own businesses. In 1991, the federal government launched the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, the most comprehensive royal commission in history. Its mandate was to study the evolution of the relationship between Aboriginal people, the Government of Canada, and Canadian society. In 1993, the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business submitted a report to the Commission outlining a number of strategic recommendations on improving Aboriginal economic development and business. These included the creation of an Aboriginal Development Bank, the development of an Aboriginal set-aside program for federal contracts, and the establishment of an Aboriginal Trade Commission based on four principles of a renewed relationship. In 1999, Canada's physical and cultural landscape took a dramatic leap forward when Nunavut territory was created. Nunavut, or our land in Inuktitut, represented the largest Aboriginal land claim in Canadian history. The CCAB moved swiftly to create strong ties with the newly elected Premier of Nunavut, Paul Okalik. Okalik gave a passionate speech at a CCAB dinner later that year on the urgent need to partner with Corporate Canada to tap the vast economic potential of the Eastern Arctic. Two years later, CCAB recognized the need to create a framework that would help companies build productive, beneficial relationships with Aboriginal communities. The Progressive Aboriginal Relations Program was the response. PAR laid out a roadmap for companies that enabled them to meet their business and sustainability goals working holistically with Aboriginal communities. CCAB's proactive approach to strengthening corporate and Aboriginal community relationships was clearly ahead of its time. By 2004, the law caught up and two historic decisions were handed down that would further bolster the economic influence of Aboriginal people. In Haida and Taku, the Supreme Court of Canada declared that the Crown has a duty to consult and accommodate First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities where development on public lands could have an impact on Aboriginal rights. The Court later determined that aspects of the duty could be delegated to companies. These decisions sent a clear message. Not only does working with Aboriginal companies make sound economic sense, it is now required by law. In 2008, an apology for a dark part of history put a spotlight on the Aboriginal reality in Canada. In a session of the House of Commons, Canada's government apologized to the victims of residential schools. The government of Canada now recognizes that it was wrong to forcibly remove children from their homes, and we apologize for having done this. This landmark event was embraced by Aboriginal leaders and all Canadians, opening the doors to greater collaboration between Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in Canada. In 2009, the CCAB marks its 25th anniversary of groundbreaking work and ongoing success. The CCAB's mandate has never been more relevant, and the stage is now set for another quarter century of progressive change. What opportunities will emerge over the next 25 years? What will the Aboriginal economy look like in 2034? One thing is clear. For each significant Aboriginal event that has impacted Canada and its people, the Canadian Council for Aboriginal Business has been there, anticipating change, driving progress, creating opportunity, and celebrating success. Join us as we embark on the next chapter of the journey. Together, we can create the next wave of economic opportunities for Aboriginal business.